as part of our seminar series this year, we've been asking all the new members of staff to do uh, alternate seminars because as a department we've had a lot of new members of staff recently and I think especially when we're looking towards collaborations and forming our research groupings uh, for forthcoming ref, it really makes sense and helps us to see what other people in the department are doing. Uh, so Michael very bravely volunteered to do the first slot uh, for the research seminars. Uh, was had his arm twisted. I did approach it. The cookies mm -hmm. at the back of the room. Not very good cookies. <laughs> John, John Moore's cookies. Um, so Michael very kindly uh, volunteered to do the first slot. So he's going to kick off our seminar series with a talk entitled Effort Investment in Gold Pursuit. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, given that the purpose of this uh, presentation by your staff is to give an impression of uh, my research, I am trying in 45 minutes to present you an overview of uh, the last 12, 13 years of my life, at least my the research <laughs> part of my life. Um, everything that I'm going to present will be about effort, and everything will be will build on a theoretical model called motivation intensity theory. Um, it's a very economic model. And I would just try to illustrate that with a sandwich. Imagine that you go to a shop um, and uh, try to get one of these sandwiches. You probably have an idea about what you are maximally willing to pay for the sandwich. So, Kath, for instance, what would you be willing to pay for the sandwich? For that particular sandwich? This one. That exact one. Mm -hmm. 250? 250, okay. Um, someone very hungry? <laughs> Not very hungry. Yeah, but you're eating right now, so it work. Um, what would you pay, Jen? About the same, I think. Okay. Someone would think that you have a, someone, a vegetarian probably? 199. 199, <laughs> perfect, okay. So, but, but you know that even you think that's the value of this sandwich, you are not going to pay the 199 or to pay the 250. What you are going to pay for the sandwich will depend on the price. So if the sandwich just, if someone is just asking 50 pence for the sandwich, you will only pay the 50 pence. You won't pay 199 or 250. Um, but it becomes interesting, what will happen if the sandwich costs 220? Kath is going to buy the sandwich? You're not going to do that because you said no, 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 it's not worth the money. So, and the same thing will happen if you only have one pound in your pocket. Then it's quite clear that if someone is asking you to pay one pound fifty, you can't, you won't buy it. And basically, the basic ideas of motivation intensity theory regarding effort mobilization is exactly the same thing. Effort is something like the money that you can invest in tasks to attain your goals, to get a sandwich, to get money, or any other kind of personal goals. So in a more formal way, the definition of the theory of effort is that resource investment to overcome obstacles and goals. So everything what allows you to attain your goals. And the first prediction, the basic, the fundamental prediction is that you try to conserve your resources, like you do it with your money, if it's worth two pounds, but you are only asked to pay 50 pence, you are not going to spend more than required. And drawing on this basic prediction, one Brem came up with second order predictions, stating that task difficulty provides you an idea about what is required to succeed in the task, to attain your goals. And for this reason, your impression of task difficulty, of task demand, should determine the effort that you invest in a task. But only, as we have seen with the sandwich example, if uh, it's possible, if you have enough effort to succeed in the task. If you don't have enough money, you're not going to spend any money to buy the sandwich. And also only if the required effort is justified by the importance of success. So if it's very, very important for you to buy a sandwich because you are very, very hungry, then you are willing to spend a lot of money. Central for correct. And finally, more less trivial, you need to have an idea about task difficulty. You need to have an idea about the price. If you don't know the price, if you don't know what is required to succeed, well, basically then task difficulty can't determine that. 
because you don't have an idea of it. And well, this is just a figure that represents the predictions. So on the x-axis you have the task difficulty, on the y-axis the effort or the resource investment. You just can see that effort should increase with task difficulty up to a point where the required energy effort is no longer justified. And then you should disengage, you should not invest any effort. If the success importance is lower, then the only thing that changes is that the point <laughs> of disengagement changes. If it's not very important for you to attain the goal, then you will only be willing to invest effort for easy tasks. If the tasks are moderately difficult, you will disengage. So success importance and any kind of variables that could be related to success importance, like rewards for instance, should only set the upper limit of this relationship between task demand and effort. It shouldn't have a direct impact. Except there's one situation where success importance should have a direct impact. All this only makes sense if you know uh, the difficulty of the upcoming task. If you don't know it, if it's unknown, or, and that's according to the theory, a slightly different situation, if the task difficulty is unfixed, then you should have a direct impact of success importance, of reward, or whatever, on effort. And the difference between a task with an unclear task difficulty and with an unknown task difficulty is that in an unclear task difficulty, the task difficulty level is set. It's not up to you to choose a certain task difficulty. But you have no information about that. So you don't know it. In an unfixed task, the idea is that it's up to you to decide how difficult the task will be. So if, for instance, you think uh, about students who can, uh, in an exam, they can just say a very, very high standard and try to get the best grade possible, then the difficulty of the task will be very, very high, or they will just aim to get just to pass the exam. Then the task difficulty will be moderate. And in the frame of the theory, that's called a task with an unfixed task difficulty. So basically, an unfixed task difficulty is up to the performer to choose a certain level of difficulty. Under unclear task difficulty conditions, it's set by the experimenter, by external factors, but you just have no information about that. The predictions should be the same. Um, just given that it's somehow informal, if you have any questions, just interrupt me and ask any time. Yeah. All right. Um, in the year 2002, when I started my PhD, there were about 20 studies that have used the self-report effort or self-reports of effort as dependent variable to test the theoretical predictions for tasks with fixed and unfixed test difficulty. And there were about 40 studies that have used cardiovascular measures to test the same predictions, basically. Mainly uh, these studies that use systolic. <coughs> and what didn't exist were studies that had tested the predictions for unclear task difficulty. So that didn't exist at all, empirical evidence. But it existed in the literature um, and in the theoretical predictions, but there were no studies on that. So basically, um, during my PhD and the years after my PhD, I was mainly concerned with the predictions for unclear task difficulty. And it's not so interesting just to uh, test if rewards or success importance has a direct impact on effort because there are many studies outside of the frame of the theory that have tested that in a certain way. For instance, in economics, people are convinced that if you have a higher salary, you put more effort in your, your tasks, in your work, and you will have a higher performance. So, and they tested that. So there was empirical evidence. But what is more important is to uh, take a look at the moderation of the determinants of effort by the clarity of task difficulty. If you, if you just go back to the theory, you see that if it's unclear, success importance should be the determinant of effort. If it's clear, task difficulty should be the direct determinant of effort. So basically, the main interest in examining the predictions for unclear task difficulty is to show that um, the clarity of task difficulty moderates the link between the determinants and effort. Just um, yeah. Sorry, give me that definition again between unfixed and unclear. 
Right. Um, or maybe you come back to that. Then. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. I, I'm not going to come back because I, I'm trying to forget and fix task difficulty. <laughs> because I think it was a bad choice. But um, the people who were working on this theory, mainly Jack Bram and one of his uh, PhD students, uh, Rex Wright, they liked unfixed task difficulty. And what they did to create tasks with unfixed task difficulty is, for instance, that they gave um, the participants a sheet of paper with thousands of letters printed on it. And then the task of the participant was just to circle E's. And for each E circled, they got a small reward of, I don't know, five cents or something like that. So basically, in this kind of tasks, there is no fixed task difficulty. It's not just a question, can you succeed on tasks, or do you fail? It's completely up to you. You can just slow down and just circle in five minutes two E's, and you will get 15 pence. And then the task difficulty is very, very easy. But you also can aim for identifying all and circling all the E's on the sheet of paper, and then it might be a very, very difficult task mm -hmm. and require a lot of effort. And the basic prediction why for unfixed task difficulty the pattern should be the same was that Jack Brehm <laughs> suggested that you have an additional, well, he added an additional assumption. He suggested if it's up to you to choose the level of difficulty, then you automatically are aiming for the highest level of difficulty that is justified. So, oh yeah, that basically was the situation. And I didn't like it because it, it was so complicated. It was so complicated and it, it just it, it didn't only draw on the basic prediction of energy conservation, it needed this additional prediction that you are always trying to uh, attain the best performance that's justified and something like that. So I just thought it was complicated. And it looked very, very easy to, or more interesting just to examine the basic prediction. Test difficulty can be clear or unclear and not to have this complicated design. Does that answer your question? All right. Um, I'm only going to present you one study on that, and before I can present it, I just have to briefly say something about the rationale, why systolic blood pressure reactivity should be an indicator of effort. Basically, it draws on an idea of uh, Rex Wright, who read the papers of Paul August, a physiologist who had observed that if people engage in tasks where the task outcome depends on their performance, then sympathetic activity increases. All respond is task engagement. And basically, um, Rex White, the PhD student of Jack Brehm, he knew about motivation intensity theory, and there you have effort, and he read the papers of Obris, and there you have the term task engagement, and he thought, wow, effort, task engagement, same thing. So basically, um, he defined that effort should be associated with sympathetic impact on the heart. And then he read some textbooks on cardiovascular physiology, and he observed that, well, and he had a blood pressure monitor, and the blood pressure monitor gives you heart rate, that's indicated here, and blood pressure, that's indicated here, and he knew that he was interested in examining sympathetic impact on the heart, so this link. He wasn't interested in uh, examining parasympathetic impact on the heart, so he tried to get an indicator of this. And he observed that heart rate probably is not a good indicator, because as you can see, both the parasympathetic impact uh, system and the sympathetic system have an impact on that. So that's not a very good, reliable indicator probably, if you're only interested in sympathetic activity. And then he discovered that, well, but this parameter, the fourth with which the heart contracts, it mainly depends on sympathetic effect. So if one could have an indicator of the force of the heart contraction, then one would have a good measure of sympathetic impact. Well, he only had the blood pressure monitor. So heart rate, no, blood pressure. And then he came up with the idea, well, that's how blood pressure changes directly after the blood is ejected. Directly after the blood gets ejected in the aorta, blood pressure rises to a maximum value, called systolic blood pressure, and then it drops to diastolic blood pressure. And basically, the idea of Rex was just, given that the heart contracts here, 
and just temporarily, systolic blood pressure, this point, is more close to the event of heart contraction than diastolic blood pressure. And for this reason, systolic blood pressure should be more closely related to the sympathetic impact on the heart. That we are the ideas of Rex, basically. So he suggested systolic blood pressure, maximum blood pressure is associated with that. All right, just a single study. Um, everyone performed the same task. It was a memory task. Um, we provided participants with a list of 30 nonsense letter series, each one composed of four letters. So for instance, one was A, L, and P. And uh, 30, and they had to memorize the 30 letters series in uh, five minutes, which is uh, impossible. <laughs> so everyone performed this impossible task. And we had a condition, the clear test difficulty condition, where we told participants what they had to do exactly. So memorize a 30 letter series, each one consisting of four letters, in five minutes. And with an unclear test difficulty condition, the task was the same, but we didn't tell participants what they had to do. We just informed them, well, we will present you a, ser a letter series and, well, just learn them. So no information about the number of letter series and all this stuff. And then we manipulated also success importance. The second variable that's <coughs> important. We had first a baseline measurement period and then they performed the memory task. Again, the instructions, the unclear task difficulty, just learn all letter series. No additional information about test difficulty was provided. And in the clear test difficulty condition, and everything one can imagine about test difficulty was uh, uh, communicated to the participants. And then participants could either earn 10 Swiss francs, which is about seven pounds, for successfully learning and recalling all the 30 letter series after five minutes, or there was no particular reward. Just keep in mind, according to a theory, if it's unclear to you, the reward, success importance, should determine your effort investment. If you have a clear idea about test difficulty, then the reward shouldn't matter. You're going to pay the price that is required, and you are not going to invest uh, the effort that you are, would be willing to invest maximally in this. And while well, basically, I'm not going to present you absolute systolic blood pressure values, I'm going to present you change scores from the baseline period at rest to test performance. So the higher the blood pressure value, the higher the effort. These two bars on the left are the unclear condition. This is the 10 Swiss francs condition. This is the no reward condition. So you can see the difference between the rewards. And this is the clear test difficulty condition. So if participants knew that it was impossible to succeed, reward didn't matter. Any questions? OK, 2006, after a series of uh, experiments on unclear test difficulty, we, uh, well, we, we still had the studies on self-reported effort and on systolic blood pressure reactivity with fixed and unfixed test difficulty, and additionally, six studies on unclear test difficulty. Well, but that might seem a little bit uh, contradictory now, because I told you that Wright suggested that systolic blood pressure is linked to a sympathetic impact on the heart. But it seems that he never had problems in publishing his papers. I had. Um, I had many, many reviews where reviews were just telling me, well, that's nice, but there's a gap in your logic because blood pressure can't be a good indicator of, systolic, uh, of sympathetic impact in the heart. Because you have all this. Blood pressure is what comes <coughs> out here. And blood pressure is determined by cardiac output and by total peripheral resistance. And in particular, on cardiac output, you have the impact of heart rate. And as we have seen before, heart rate is determined by parasympathetic stimulation. So if heart rate 
is a poor indicator of sympathetic activity, blood pressure, who is a function of heart rate, can't be a good one. And the radios were always pointing out that there might be a good, a more appropriate indicator of sympathetic impact on the heart, PEP, pre-ejection period. And when I first tried to convince the people who were already working with the theory for some years, they said, no, we don't need that, we don't need that. We have our blood pressure monitor, that's perfect. Well, I, I think we needed it. And basically, the only addition that we had to make is that we say PEP is the best indicator of sympathetic activity. And blood pressure doesn't tell us, doesn't tell us much about that. So if you would like to test what Rex Wright predicted, that effort is linked to sympathetic activity, <coughs> you shouldn't uh, just draw conclusions on the blood pressure studies. You need a better indicator of the sympathetic activity. And that's PEP. And PEP is um, just this tiny time interval. This is an ECG representing the electric activity of the heart. And this is an ICG, the signal from MMP and uh, cardiograph. Um, basically, it reflects the change in the electric resistance of the thorax. And you need two points. You are using the Q point of the ECG that indicates the onset of the electrical stimulation of the left ventricle, so the beginning of the excitation of the heart, and the B point, which indicates the opening of the aortic valve. So pre-ejection period is a period, well, directly before the ejection of the blood. And this tiny interval is a good indicator of the force with which the heart contracts. If the heart contracts stronger due to increased sympathetic activity, the interval gets smaller. If there's less sympathetic impact, the force is reduced and the interval gets smaller. Well, and here you have uh, some biopack impedance cardiographs, uh, which use band electrodes. Uh, in Geneva, I've used uh, one that is more, more comfortable for participants, at least, because you are using spot electrodes that you put here and here, um, as shown on the picture, and then you get this signal. Any question? Okay. So, and then what I did is just Basically, um, I just repeated some of the older studies on the basic predictions of the theory using PEP. Yeah. I did have one question. Do you, do you have any control on that procedure for a movement or um, right. <laughs> You have to control. You don't have to control for it because yeah. if the participant moves, you don't get the signal. Okay. <laughs> so um, participants really have to sit still yeah. and don't move a lot. Okay. If they move, you just have, you can't use the data basically. Well, the first one, very simple, just test difficulty impact on effort or on PEP. Four levels of difficulty, three possible difficulty levels, one impossible, so we should observe the salt tooth pattern, disengagement if test difficulty is impossible. And uh, well, it's a classical design, so you have a baseline period, and then you have a task period, and you subtract both. And the task was just a modified uh, Sternberg task. This is the easy condition. First, the letter series was presented for one second, then it was masked. The participant had to decide if the blue letter was presented in the letter series or not. Was it presented? Yes. So, very, very easy. A little bit more difficult, but still possible. No, wasn't present. And now the heart condition. No, no, no. no exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that's 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 possible, but it's it's very hard. You you really have to consider it. And now the impossible condition, and well, depending on the computer, it works or it doesn't work. Oh, no. yes. yes. Well, no. If, 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 yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> well, basically, if, if you run it on E prime or an um so software that really allows you to, to control the duration of the presentation, you have no chance. Just you have 50% performance. That's not idea. You can't see it. 
All right, so this was the task, and these are the results. I'm just going, given that this is well, the historical perspective, systolic blood pressure, so you see that it increases across the th three possible conditions and then impossible condition disengagement. And pre ejection period shows the same pattern. It's just that given that the pre ejection period interval gets uh, smaller when sympathetic impact increases and when effort increases, the change scores are negative. So more negative scores indicate higher effort. Um, one more um, with unclear test difficulty and only um, manipulation of success importance across three levels. The task was a delayed matching to sample test. Basically, you first present a pattern of dots. You presented, I think it was pattern consisting of 50 dots, so many dots, and then some of the dots change the color to a lighter gray, and you have to memorize the position of these dots. And then it's masked, and then you just uh, <coughs> have something to compare, and you have to decide do these pattern match or not. If you only have two dots, it's quite easy, but you have a task where a task difficulty is unclear, we varied the number of points that changed the color. So from one trial to the other trial, it was the participant couldn't predict the difficulty of the next trial. So under these conditions of the unclear test difficulty, the reward that we presented should have a direct impact. Basically, that's what we found. And that's one of, I would say, 50% of all the studies where we have assessed both systolic blood pressure and pre ejection period, it looks like that. That uh, the pre ejection period is nice and systolic blood pressure is, well, could be better. It's close, but it's not as perfect. Any questions? So you should have got your first papers published for that, I mean, because the pattern seems more or less the same. Only with uh, systolic blood pressure? Yeah. You mean? I mean, there's yep. no additional dramatic insight that you get from PET versus um, Well, it's, it's, it's relatively dramatic if you care about the precision of your measure sure. and if you care about the definition of effort. Yeah. If you define effort as sympathetic impact on the heart yeah. and then you assess something that's only loosely connected to sympathetic activity, well, that's not so good. It, it, it would be the same if you say that, well, I'm interested in depression yeah. and I know that there's a link between depression and anxiety so instead of measuring depression, I'm going to measure anxiety. Mm -hmm. Well, it's correlated, yes, but it's, it's not what, what you really would like to measure. Yeah. Okay, I'm um, 2,000 allowed. More studies with systolic blood pressure, some studies with pre-ejection period reactivity, um, but no studies on the first the fundamental prediction that you are aiming at conserving energy. Because what you've shown in all these studies was just the task difficulty and uh, success and purpose have an impact as predicted by the theory. But the basic idea is of energy conservation is you are only investing the energy that is required and not more. Mm. And none of these studies provide any information about that because that's not possible with cardiovascular measures. Because you cannot quantify with a cardiovascular measure what is required. Just think about, would you be able to quantify what is minimally required to understand my talk in terms of increases in heartbeats? No. I could measure the change in heartbeat. But if I observe that Simon has an increase of 10 heartbeats, I would know if that was required of, or if he just increased heart, the heart rate more than required, and probably even with a small increase of five heartbeats, he would also have been able to understand my job. So the basic problem with cardiovascular measures regarding the energy conservation idea is you, you have no standard. You cannot test that if really individuals try only to invest what is required and not more. And for this reason, a change in another change in the dependent variable um, no longer physiological measures, a measure of force. 
and the reason why I think that um, effort and time group force are related, or time group force is related to energy investment, is the following. Basically, you know that ATP is the basic energy compound for 99.9% .9 of all body we work. Whenever you think, whenever you run, you consume ATP. So that's the energy that you're using. And when you contract your muscles, this one is probably the interesting one. The muscle contraction, um, according to the sliding filament theory, is driven by the interaction of two molecules, uh, myosin and actin. And basically what happens is that the myosin heads contact the actin filaments and do something that we could call a rowing stroke. And then the muscle slides of the two molecules slide together, that shortens your muscle, and that increases muscle force, or that creates muscle force. And for each uh, cross bridge, for each interaction between the myosin head and uh, the actin filament, you consume exactly one molecule of ATP. And the more rowing strokes, the more interactions between actin and myosin, the higher the exerted force. So there's a link between the amount of ATP consumed, the amount of actin myosin interactions, and the amount of exerted force. And that's not only a theoretical perspective, there are a number of publications that have measured, a measured ATP consumption and exerted force that show that there's an almost linear relationship, mainly in tasks that are isometric, where the muscle doesn't show. So, for this reason, if one is interested in assessing energy investment, the resources that are required to attain a goal, one could just measure exerted force. So, it's no longer a mental task or something like that, it becomes a physical task. But the theory should hold for any kind of task. And what we've developed is a paradigm that one could call the catch-up task. To measure exerted force, you use a device, a dynamometer, and participants just exert force on the dynamometer, and that's measured. And by exerting force, participants could um, control the catch-up task. They first saw a, a bottle, well, a ketchup bottle, for a couple of seconds, and then they were asked to squeeze during two seconds to free the ketchup bottle. So I told them, imagine that you are on a barbecue party and you have a clogged ketchup bottle. What do you do to get some ketchup out of the bottle? Well, you just squeeze as hard as you can um, to free the bottle. So participants could, during two seconds, just exert force on the dynamometer that represented the ketchup bottle. And if they exceeded, or attained or exceeded, a force standard that we had set, then they were successful and uh, the ketchup bottle ejected that counted as a success. If uh, they didn't exceed the required force, it just continued to be this uh, picture. It was just a And with this kind of paradigm, you can easily manipulate all the variables that are of importance to the theory. You can change the required force to manipulate test difficulty. And for instance, you could present different amounts of reward for successful trials to manipulate success inputs. Any questions? Right. Okay. Um, the first task, just a manipulation of test difficulty across four conditions. Three conditions are possible. One, 500 newtons is um, impossible for most um, students, at least for 100% of our students in Geneva, that was impossible. I'm quite sure that here for psychology students it will be the same thing, but you have these uh, sports uh, students, and there <laughs> might be uh, some guys who are able to exert a force higher than 500 meters. Um, I just brought one of these. Um, to squeeze that, you need 170 oh, wow. newtons. Seven? Yeah. 170. Um, so I think for our female participants, um, 190, 200 were the maximum that they could score. Well, participants performed um, 100 trials of, these, of this catch-up task. Um, there were 20 trials of each difficulty condition. 
and the reward wasn't manipulated. For each uh, successful trial, they could get uh, five centimes, which is about three pence. Um, and we just have analyzed the last 20 trials, because the first, the, the first 80 trials served as practice period. Because if you just if you start doing the task, you'll have no idea what it means to exert 50 newtons, 100 meters, or something like that. So first 80 trials that we didn't analyze were just participants got the feedback success failure that allowed them to learn what it means, and then the last 20 um, trials were the critical trials. And this is uh, the measure of exerted peak force, so the maximum force that a participant exerted during the two seconds. And this was the value that was compared to with the force standard to determine if the trial was a success or a failure. And well, basically, first thing, what you can see, it just replicates the pre previous findings. You get the sawtooth pattern. But now you can compare and test the energy conservation principle. Okay, so can here, 50 newtons were acquired. That's the dotted line that represents that. And you see that participants squeezed harder than necessary. And that's well, the same thing in all studies and in all conditions. And furthermore, you also see that participants did not completely disengage if it was impossible. Just imagine the situation. 80 trials, and among the 80 trials, 20 trials were before starting the trial, you are informed that now there's a trial with 500 newtons are required. You do that 80 times. And then in the critical trials, you still continue to squeeze. Well, I'm sure that our participants knew at this moment that it was impossible for them to succeed the 500 newton trials. But nevertheless, they squeezed a little bit. Yes. Sorry, this why do you suppose that so they didn't need to squeeze, but why would they squeeze as much as they'd squeeze for 150? If they're actually trying, why would you not bother trying your hardest to get 500? Good question. Good question. Basically, um, I have an idea about that, mm -hmm. um, but that's basically future research. Um, just the theory doesn't answer that. Mm -hmm. And other theories that may draw on well, one could, for instance, just say, well, they just redefined the task. So they just considered not only the reward that they were offered, they just might think, well, I'm in a lab, and the experimenter expects me to do something. Mm -hmm. In psychological research, normally, you are not allowed just to sit still and do nothing. <laughs> so basically, it just be that they somehow redefined the task, and it was no longer the task about exceeding or not the required force. They just did something to please the experiment or something like that. So you could have some kind of post hoc explanations. But the so there's more variation in that condition, mm -hmm. where it's the presence of a Here it looks like, like that. Yeah. 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 So exactly. Here, here it looks like that. We had to be. So would that change if the, if the other conditions, so let's say instead of having a 150 condition, you have everything else below 100? Because then also you need less energy to achieve things you need to actually. Because you may just find if it is a 500 trial, you can serve energy because you're in a task where you know you can get money for achieving the 150 trial. But if you're a female participant, that takes quite a lot of energy. I, I'm sure these data are from a between design. Uh, they are from a within design. design. So it was the case in this task. We had some between designs and some within designs. So here, it really changed from one trial to another trial. You either had 50 newtons or 100 or 150 or 500 newtons. So there is a chance in that design that you could conserve energy on 500 on the basis, but then why not if there was... The yeah, you would expect that strong and motivation tend to be theory. Okay. Yeah? Does it change depending on how many previous practice trials the participants give them? Like, um, yes, it does. Um, basically, I'm not, I'm not going to show you this data, but we also had a task where it was unclear, so just we were using the first trials to test that, and then basically what you get is a reward effect, as one would expect from a theory. So, so basically, but, but, but the problem of the theory at least to explain this kind of stuff is that the basic prediction is that energy conservation is the sole motivation underlying effort. 
organization. And that doesn't fit. You probably could construct a model that mixes energy conservation with the motivation to uh, right, to, to, to succeed, something like that. So one could, for instance, argue in these conditions, well, you want to get the reward, so it's not wise to invest exactly 15 newtons, because for whatever kind of reason it might happen, yet you, that you just fall short of the standard and you don't get the reward. So if you really want to assure that you get the reward, you do a little bit more than you think would be minimally required. So what could model that like that? But just for the theory, that's something that's impossible to explain. And probably what you, yeah. No, 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 no. Is it, is, has any of this, this stuff been done using sort of like a dual task paradigm in any way? I'm just thinking within a lab setting, you've basically got the, you know, you either exert energy in, in, in a grip force or you do nothing at all. If it's a situation where you're choosing to exert energy or perform another task or kind of pay attention yeah. to another task, then potentially not doing anything in the 500 newton is actually an advantageous thing to kind of think, well, this is my trial to focus on. Yeah, I agree, but um, and, and probably under these conditions, mm. you would find a full disengagement. Yeah. The problem would be that these kind of experiments would no longer be related to the theory, mm. because the theory doesn't predict um, task choice or something like that. It just predicts yeah. effort investment basically after we have chosen to to do the task. Yeah. So it would no longer test the theory. Tandems, did you get into trajectory data? So the speed at which they reach max then peak, did you measure the, the uh, Yeah, but the two, two seconds is uh, a very, very small time window for that. Mm -hmm. So basically, it takes about, I, I don't know, 100 milliseconds to reach the maximum force, and then they stay there for two or three, four. So it's small. just very small. I, I've looked at that, but I, I didn't see anything systematic or something, but it's just an extra small. If you take any measures, I was wondering whether anxiety was more to like this. Maybe the more anxious you are, the more conservative you are, so maybe the more you fit the model. No. No, you didn't know that. We didn't We didn't We didn't Not at all. Maybe a very naive question, but what success, the motivation to succeed, is a complete variable amongst individuals. Right. And on that, you can probably see that some people will think, I must have got close to 500 before when I was practicing. I'm sure I can do it. I'm bloody minded. I'm going to do it. And there'll be a handful of individuals who think that way because you can't control what is important to an individual. Every one of us would probably approach that task with a slightly different mental approach. Mm -hmm. It won't be solely driven, presumably, by the reward. There'll be that human quality mixed into that sort of glad to say this thing again. Plant biochemist, um, I'm completely out of my depth here. But it, it, surely that's a factor that you cannot control for. Is that sort of randomness of of what is important to an individual? That's sort of extrinsic, intrinsic thing. So you're right. 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 about yeah. doing well, the thing rather than getting the reward. One could try to control for that, mm. but basically what would happen would just reduce error variance. Mm. Yeah. So. Um, I don't know if, if here if I decrease error variance, basically what will happen probably that these uh, errors get smaller, something like that. And well, the pattern is already very strong. It will just get a more strong pattern. Basically, it's really it's a it's a problem of a theoretical approach that basically uh, puts the emphasis on energy conservation. Yeah, but says that this is the most important thing. But to me. Uh, not working in the field, I would suggest that, that does demonstrate the theory is yep. correct. The, the, in the sense that you don't have zero efforts at 500 newtons because of that intrinsic quality in humans to have a go in a way regardless. Well, in some individuals perhaps. I mean, is that correct? Is that only it's probably nonsense? I don't know. Basically, but for the theory, there's only, there are only two options. You either think that it's impossible and then you do nothing. Or you think it's possible, and then you do what is required. There's, for the theory, there's nothing in between. Like it would be the case when you go to the shop and try to buy the sandwich. 
you, they, you wouldn't just, you know, you have five pounds in your pocket and um, they are asking you to pay seven pounds. You wouldn't say, okay, here are two pounds. You wouldn't do that, right? In that paradigm, I agree. But I think building on that previous point, context matters. So if you're in a context where you actually engage in some form of haggling, you know, that you, even if you have don't have the required money, you might engage in other strategies to obtain the goal and to purchase. And the same applies even to a mouse. You know, put into a cage, starving, not knowing there's no food visible. But you know, some mice are more exploratory, pressing levers and stuff, and accessing others aren't. And another final point, <laughs> which is like you know, I bet you could get stronger gender differences. Given the task is, you know, you could prime gender roles, you could prime stereotype threat. If you told your female participants that generally females are not performing very well, so that could either suppress or even, you know, fire them up to show that you're wrong. So I love what I'm seeing, and the, the model is so cute and neat and beautiful. But it's so bare of social individual differences. But you're seeing the problem of this data <coughs> for the model. Yeah. 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 yeah because yeah, that's yeah. the main point. Yeah, yeah, I'm not trying to, to, to defend the model. No, yeah. no, not at all. Yeah. I, I'm just trying to point out that the model is well, there, there's something missing in the model. And the problem, at least for me, is that in the literature there are no models that could explain this and all the preceding research on the theory. Hmm. And if we somehow have the aim to come up in 200, <laughs> thousands, 10,000 years with a model that allows us really to predict, to describe effort mobilization, then we basically, I think, we just, just try always to have a model that allows us to predict something. And if you discover that the existing models are not sufficient, we have to develop a new model. Right. Um, probably I just uh, skip the second experiment because it basically shows the same thing. Um, and I will just continue with that because that, well, so many studies with cardiovascular measures, systolic blood pressure, EP, and some with uh, exerted force, 18, because um, this paradigm is so small that you really can run many, many experiments very, very fast. Um, drawing on these problems that we've observed in the head group tests, the basic question is, um, what does it mean for the cardiovascular changes that we've observed? The basic idea of the model of Rex White was always that it's about resources that you invest to do something, so some kind of energy investment. And the problem with that is that there are other researchers, well, even Oberist or um, Douglas Carroll, who have found that the energy investment in mental health and their responses of the cardiovascular system are sometimes dissociated. So in standard paradigms, um, what Carroll, for instance, has found is that if you measure the link between energy investment using oxygen consumption as an indicator and uh, for instance the increase in heartbeat when people are on a treadmill so when they do a physical test you use the correlation or the association between these two measures to get some kind of uh, equation that allows you to predict uh, um, the increase in heart rate drawing on oxygen consumption and then you take this equation and bring it to a mental test and again people engage on the mental task and you assess oxygen consumption as an indicator of energy investment and their change in uh, heart frequency and then you observe that the increase in heart rate in this mental task is much more than you would have expected drawing on the association that you have found in the physical task. So the basic question is this overshot of cardiovascular responses that one observes in mental tests is it stable? Is it just some additional factor like uh, representing test anxiety or whatever? 
Or does it just mean that you have two kinds of efforts? That what the people measured in the studies with cardiovascular measures was somehow the psychological effort. I don't know, I put here that the feeling of being engaged in a task. And that basically that the theory predicts only this feeling of being engaged in the task. And that's indicated by the increase in cardiovascular responses. Or do these cardiovascular responses indeed reflect the investment of energy? So more ATP that is used. And basically, for some of my colleagues, they don't care. They don't care if you call it mental effort and if mental effort is energy. They just love the word effort. But I think it's important. It's important to know if it's really something like in a physical task where you put resources, energy in it, and you do the mental task, and then the resources are consumed. And if the theory really predicts this, or if the theory just predicts the feeling of being engaged, self-reported efforts. That's what I started to do in a project, and that what I will continue to examine here. Um, it's also for physiologists, for uh, people who know something about exercise physiology, they are surprised that we only assessed sympathetic effect on the heart. Because when you do a physical task, if you just you start walking or something like that, your sympathetic activity doesn't change. Your heartbeat increases and probably also your blood pressure will increase a little bit, but all that is driven by a withdrawal of the parasympathetic activity. So in physical tasks, you first observe for low intensity levels, you first observe a change in parasympathetic activity, and only for higher intensity levels, you observe a change in sympathetic activity. So for people who have an exercise physiology background, that's just somehow strange, the focus on sympathetic activity. So one um, future research would just be to assess in this kind of mental test both parasympathetic activity and sympathetic activity. Well, when we spoke about that, um, I think there's a need for another theoretical account to explain that. This has never been applied. Everything that I told you is not very applied. Um, but fortunately, audiologists um, started 10 years ago to think and to conduct research about listening effort because they observed that many people um, with uh, listening problems, many hearing impaired people, they even, after getting a hearing aid, and even after a good calibration of the hearing aid, these people come back and complain about fatigue, about uh, high listening effort. So people working on listening effort already started to looking for physiological indicators of this listening effort fatigue process. So basically, that would be an application of the theory um, where I already submitted a project that's just under review right now. And, well, but that's just uh, for physiologists, that's interesting. Um, the validation of uh, the pre-ejection period, all the studies have been done in the 60s, 70s and they've done with other met methods. Most of them didn't use uh, impedance cardiographs. And uh, just producers are continuing to develop new machines and new software packages. And researchers are just uh, publishing papers about um, the correct way to detect the opening of the aortic valve, but they never do any validation studies. So it's, it's completely just the signal has to look nice they don't care no longer about the validation. So basically, there's also a need to, to validate the current passage. So next time, I am going to present studies on cardiovascular response and oxygen consumption mental task to address the first one, and something on the link between sympathetic activity and parasympathetic activity and effort mobilization, and something on the new theory, probably, and something about listening effort and physiological indicators of listening effort, and probably, no, I'm not going to present. <laughs> well, thank you very much for an interesting talk. I think Michael probably answered a lot of our questions during the talk, but if anyone has a one or two very quick questions, you can probably have time for them. Thanks, Michael, for an interesting talk.
And I was just thinking there at the end there when you were mentioning, you know, there's a lack of application to real world problems, particularly in the notion of defining effort in seeking out a reward, you know, which, um, or achieving success, or what sort of efforts is being put in, which is really relevant in the area of addiction mm -hmm. uh, and reward motivated behaviors. I just wonder is there, if you can come across, or can you see any, um, you know, the amount of effort that somebody invests yeah. to actually seek out yeah. uh, something that changes their affective state. I don't know studies in the context of addiction, but in the context of depression, there's a lot, there are many physiological studies on reward responsiveness. Mm. Because you have this idea that depressed people um, don't react to rewards, and for this reason they just don't engage in any kind of activity. Um, and uh, in, in this context, people tried to also to find physiological indicators of this reward responsiveness, which basically comes close to the idea um, if you present a reward, is the person going to invest effort to get the reward or not? Yeah. So I think that's quite close. Yeah. But in this domain, it's completely driven by the idea that rewards determine effort, determine outcome. They do not at all consider task difficulty to be an important factor. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, thanks. Well, that's a smaller question. I don't know if maybe a bit foolish, but you've not mentioned risk in, in, in that. You know, the, you've got a, a reward there, but there's an element of risk. And I was again thinking about the energy conservation results, thinking if attempting the five, if, if the task at 150 newtons win big prizes. That was fairly easy, mm -hmm. I'd suggest. And you could probably do it a lot. So if attempting the 500 newtons doesn't prevent you from undertaking another test by completely using up your energy, mm -hmm. then you might have a go. So I think, you, you, I'm not sure I'm explaining properly, but unless it becomes a limiting factor, if I attempt that, I'm not, I know I'm not going to be able to do the 150 newtons immediately afterwards, because my muscles will be tired, then you might take the decision, no, I'm not going to do it. I'll conserve my energy. If, if we were all asked to do the pole vault, and Sergei Bukka joined us, those of you who are younger might not know <laughs> Sergei Bukka, he broke, broke the world record 35 times or something silly. We might not attempt an 18 metre high pole vault, because we'd probably break our necks. Sergei Bukka would. Hmm. Likewise, if you've got Olympic athletes and you told them to pull up 18 metres, most of them probably wouldn't bother because they knew it was beyond their capability. But one or two would, because for them as an individual, that wasn't an achievable target. So is it the population data that's important or the individual person data is another factor here? So sort of how an individual response might be different. I, I, I have too many ideas. Yeah, no, I think what you're pointing out basically goes in the direction of what I'm suggesting in this new model. Because basically the theory, I think, um, holds for conditions where you are absolutely certain about what is required. That means that you like with a sandwich price. You know, if the price is two pounds, you will not get it for 1.99, zero chance. If you pay two pounds, you will get it, 100% chance of getting it. If you pay two pounds, 20, you still, you won't increase the chance. Yeah. I think for this kind of situation, the theory holds, but probably it would be more useful to um, model this certainty, because with investing more and more effort, you can increase the probability of succeeding in the task. So probably that might be the reason why uh, all participants invest in that possible condition. If you think about your students, if you were, when you were a student, if you had an exam that was very, very difficult, and even if you knew that 90% failed the first time when they tried, nevertheless, you did something to prepare. Probably you didn't prepare the exam for weeks or something like that. But you take, took a quick look at the book or something like that. So you did a little bit. Because you had the expectations, probably I'm lucky. 
and I will just the first only the single topic that I prepared will be a question in the exam and will allow me to pass the exam. So I think that in, in real life situations it's more that we think if I do a little bit, I get a chance of two percent to five percent. If you do something more, I can increase it to 10, 50, 60, 70. And then you are somehow calibrating that. You have this motivation, you really want to get the reward. And that's why you want to invest effort to increase the probability of getting it. But you also don't want to waste it. And I think you have these two opposing tendencies somehow. I think that addresses the uncertainty. Yeah, I, I think the buying a sandwich analogy is not doesn't fit very well, does it? Because you either have two pounds or you don't have two pounds. If, if the price of the sandwich was to vary, and the amount of money was okay. to vary, it's almost sort of a, a risk situation. Again, you don't know how much energy you've got for the group. Although well, you might practice, you don't quite know whether you've succeeded, I guess, mm -hmm. and 499 newtons for five occasions, which some people might think. Two pounds is two pounds. That's a very fixed asset. We don't know how much I presume how much effort has been put in each time. And therefore it's difficult then to judge how how close you get perhaps to achieving that goal. Whereas we know one pound ninety nine isn't uh, enough to buy the sandwich. Would you mind lifting that? Just lift it. Okay. Yeah. You had no overshoot in energy. You didn't invest and you invested in that. Mm -hmm. So basically I think that the physical task is an example where the feedback of your muscles mm. is so rapid mm. that it looks like if you would know exactly what to invest. Mm. So I think physical tasks like this one, yeah. that's an example where the theory would fit because there you know you know exactly what to do. I would completely agree. Okay. In most mental tasks, you wouldn't be able to do that. But I just wanted to show you an example that even in real life, there's something that comes close to this idea you only do what is required. It's interesting as well because the parallels with addiction, for example, in gambling, you know, people will, will, will discount. You know, they will, they will. Some people are risk averse and others aren't. And there's a, a process of discounting that will go on once you've got some predictability of the gains that you're likely to make mm -hmm. on particular talents. So we have an intuitive knowledge about that, and some people are better at predicting that. And some people will take the risk for the big payoff. Which may happen, which the likelihood of is very slim, but they will put a lot of effort into that because others won't. So that's a classic example of why a much more noisy paradigm mm -hmm. compared to physical activity. Mm -hmm. So I think as you increase more mental activity and choice issues, yeah. paradigm, then, then the paradigm becomes noisier. But it, it seems to you know, be very clear with the physical, this is an, a direct intuition, is this awareness that is. Subconscious. But probably it's just, it's just faster. Yeah, it's yeah. just much more faster. Yeah. 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 One more. Sorry, I was, it's hopefully a quick question and a quick answer. I might have misunderstood the experimental paradigm, but I'm thinking back to Simon's idea that there are differentials between individuals in terms of whether they'll put that extra effort into that futile task. Is it possible from that time point and the second one to look at, to analyze the trial by trial data to see whether some people learn the futility of the impossible task faster than others? So they they form differentially in that classic area. Yeah. Um, I I would say it probably in, in forty or fifty percent of our experiments I didn't see that. So it really was that in the impossible condition um, we just invested 50, 60, 80 million. Everyone did that more or less. And but there were other studies where we had I don't know, two, five percent of all participants who always stayed engaged and who always exerted their maximum force. And some participants, five percent, really disengaged. So just put the hand on the line. Mm -hmm. But you don't see evidence from the trial by trial in learning? Um, what, 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 you, what you see, you see a learning thing. When, when, when they start the task, they put a lot of effort in the task, and then it decreases. But it, it just doesn't continue like that. It gets slow, it really comes close to zero. Right, okay, that would be my, my best impression of Kathleen. Thanks very much, Jim. Kathleen's just asked me to go through a couple of